Okay, so I'm a postdoc uh, working for David Nutt at Imperial. Um, I've been working, uh, researching psychedelic drugs for the last five years or so. Um, I completed my PhD four years ago and been working on really just this subject matter for the last five years. Um, so I'll try and give you the basics first. We'll start with the term itself, psychedelic, what does it mean and where does it come from? Well, when you hear psychedelic, most people think about psychedelic art and, and really it conjures up ideas of psychedelic culture. And so you might think of geometric hallucinations and colourful patterns and this kind of thing, the kind of uh, art and iconography that you associate with the 60s. But that's actually quite far from where the term actually originates. So. In the mid-1950s, a uh, British um, psychiatrist, Humphrey Osmond, was carrying out work with uh, mescaline and LSD. Uh, Aldous Huxley, the, the um, writer and intellectual, uh, learnt of, of Osmond's work, and he was very interested in, in the idea of, of these drugs. So he sought out um, Humphrey and uh, asked whether he would provide him with some mescaline and supervise his own psychedelic experience. So after some deliberation, Osmond was uh, worried about sending the great Aldous Huxley mad, but uh, he did actually relent and, and he provided him with some mescaline and, and Aldous Huxley had an incredibly profound experience which he wrote about in his famous book, uh, The Doors of Perception. So in uh, conversations between these men after Aldous had had his experience, they were looking for a, a, uh, a useful word that could define and describe this class of drugs because previously they'd really just been referred to as hallucinogens. They'd also been looked at in the context of models of psychosis. There was an idea that they generate some of the symptomatology of, of psychosis or schizophrenia. But these men thought that uh, the, um, the current words didn't really capture the essence of what these drugs do and how they change consciousness and, and maybe how they work in the brain. So um, Os uh, Huxley had suggested a term which uh, Osmond, Osmond wasn't very um, sort of impressed with and he came up with his own and he actually combined the Greek words um, for mind or soul, psyche, with the word uh, delos, uh, apologies for my uh, translation, but um, so uh, delos means to make visible or clear or to manifest. So in combination, these words um, describe the drugs as mind manifestors or mind revealers. And so already there's something, uh, you know, quite interesting. These guys are trying to capture some key property of these drugs and they really think that the primary property is one of making the mind manifest. So that's for me is intriguing in itself that, that there should be aspects of the mind which aren't normally available to consciousness and these drugs might be use, used as tools to get at those aspects of the mind. So why study psychedelics? Well there's been some interesting recent work carried out in the US that has administered quite a, a large dose of uh, psilocybin, the uh, compound found in magic mushrooms. So they've administered a large dose of psilocybin to um, a, a relatively large sample of uh, research participants. And they found that two thirds of these participants described their experience as being one of the most profound of, of their whole lives, within the top five most profound experiences of their lives. And so when asked what that means, what does that translate to? they would say it was comparable to such things as the birth of their first child or the death of somebody very close uh, parent. Um, so it really was up there with, uh, you know, major life events. So again, we've got, we've got some context here, which is helping to uh, communicate really that these drugs profoundly affect consciousness and are interesting scientifically.
This psychiatrist was working with LSD in the 1960s and he was particularly effusive about uh, these drugs and their potential. He said that psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution could be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology or the telescope is for astronomy. These tools make it possible to study important processes that under normal circumstances are not available for direct observation. So inspired by these, these findings and particularly Stanislav Grof actually is uh, an interesting chap. Um, you know, I've become uh, very interested in, in psychedelics and the question of how they work in the brain. Given that they have such profound psychological effects, we, it's, it's uh, a natural inference to think that you know, learning how they change brain activity to produce these effects are going to tell us some very important things about how consciousness is produced in the brain. So most of my work's been with psilocybin, and this is a compound found in magic mushrooms. Fortunately, it's out of season at the moment. It's not mushroom season. So you won't be getting your iPhones out and snapping this picture and going hunting at the end of uh, the talk or tomorrow. <laughs> but, um, so uh, what's striking about psilocybin and uh, its uh, metabolite, psilocin, is um, the similarity of its molecular structure to the endogenous neurotransmitter in the brain, serotonin. So I've got a pointer now. Um, here's, uh, here's psilocin. Uh, this is what psilocybin's broken down to. And here's serotonin. So this is uh, found in all of our brains in quite high concentrations. And it's a very important neurotransmitter involved in uh, modulating sleep and mood, uh, cognition, uh, lots of things that we do. Um, and it's really quite striking that only a small change in its molecular structure confers such a profound effect on consciousness when these drugs are administered to people. Uh, in the mid-1980s, it was found that uh, there's a strong positive correlation between a psychedelic drug's affinity for a particular serotonin receptor in the brain and its potency. So uh, drugs that are um, stickier at the serotonin 2A receptor, this subtype of serotonin receptor, are more potent. So to help illustrate that rule, uh, the classic psychedelic LSD is particularly sticky at this serotonin receptor, this serotonin 2A receptor. And it's also incredibly potent. It's the most potent psychedelic drug. Um, Whereas mescaline, uh, you require quite large um, amounts of, of it to um, produce hallucinogenic psychedelic effects. And it is uh, significantly less sticky, where it has a lower affinity at the serotonin 2A receptor. So already we've got some important clues here about how the drug's working in the brain. It's also been found that if you block this subtype of the serotonin receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, and then you give a psychedelic drug, uh, psilocybin, then you won't get the psychedelic effects that you normally would. So it completely attenuates the psychedelic effects of psilocybin. So this serotonin 2A receptor is important clearly for how these drugs work in the brain. So then it's important to know whereabouts in the brain is this receptor. So uh, PET work, uh, PET imaging work in humans has found that the serotonin 2A receptor is particularly highly concentrated in the cortex of the brain, so that's the outer layer of the brain, rather than the subcortical structures. And it's also especially highly expressed in what are referred to as uh, multimodal or, or high-level uh, structures in the cortex. So rather than, for instance, the visual cortex, which is, has a very specific function, or the motor cortex, you know, um, that, that, that are concerned with really only one, one, only one modality. These higher level regions uh, do more sort of general things and there's some interesting work um, looking at these regions at the moment in the context of consciousness and high level cognitive functions. So what, are, what else about the serotonin 2A receptor? Well, the cortex is organized in this uh, layered fashion. Um, there's a number of different layers and there's a particular layer in the cortex, layer five, where you find, again, a very high uh, concentration of these serotonin 2A receptors. And this, these cells here, these large pyramidal cells, 
in layer 5 of the cortex are the primary output layer of the cortex. So they're very large and they do a very important function. They're, they're thought to confer sort of top-down information. Their activity is supposed to provide contextual information about um, sensory input and other sensations. What else, what, well, what happens when you stimulate the serotonin to a receptor when it's activated by either serotonin or by a psychedelic drug? Uh, well, the effect of serotonin to a receptor stimulation is to excite that host cell and make it more likely to fire. So we know that the serotonin to a re receptor is important, we know where it is, and we know that when a psychedelic binds and stimulates this receptor, it excites that host cell. So these are some basics. So this is all low-level stuff. What, what's this really going to tell us about consciousness? Well, most of my work has been um, looking at functional brain imaging. And at this level, we get a kind of overview of the brain. We get a macroscopic, rather than microscopic, picture of brain function and what's going on in the brain. And at this level, at this network level, it's actually easier to make mappings between brain function, brain activity, and brain processes to uh, psychological phenomena. So in our first study, we use functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, to measure blood flow in the brain. And this study involved 15 healthy volunteers. They had a mean age of 34. It was an 18 minute scan and there was a placebo scan to provide us with a baseline. And then the drug scan, psilocybin. They lay in the scanner and there, there wasn't any uh, behavioural task that they had to carry out. They were simply resting there, um, in this case with a fixation cross that they were supposed to just uh, relax and, and look at. So we gave two milligrams of psilocybin. This compares to about uh, 15 milligrams of the drug given orally, um, which compares to about... Uh, People say about 20 to 40 uh, Liberty Cat Magic Mushrooms, if you want to put it in a, in a recreational context. Um, so here's the basic uh, design. Um, we've got a baseline period, and we actually administer the drug intravenously. So um, there was an infusion of the drug over 60 seconds. There was a, a pre-drug baseline, six minutes. The drug went in over 60 seconds. And the effects when the drugs given intravenously are actually incredibly rapid. They come on very quickly and actually um, even before the end of the 60 second infusion people report feeling something. So it's incredibly rapid onset and uh, the effects are quite profound. And then essentially we make a subtraction blood flow post infusion of the drug versus blood flow pre infusion and then we see where there are any changes. So the first observation we make when we do this research are the psychological ones. It takes a little while to do the brain imaging analyses. Uh, so the first thing we get are just people's descriptions of the experience. So these are some of them. There's only a couple. Uh, this volunteer said uh, there was a definite sense of lubrication, of freedom, of the cogs being loosened and firing off in all sorts of unexpected directions. This volunteer said that everything became fragmented, things were all in bits, and it was very hard to hold it all together in a co into a coherent stream. So these descriptions are useful because they already kind of suggest mechanical processes. They kind of give us clues about what might be going on in the brain, and in that way they kind of assist the mapping that we make between the brain changes and the psychological effects. So just to give you a, an introduction to something which will become important as you see the results, there's a, a particular network in the brain which is attracting a lot of interest at the moment. This network is metabolically hungry, it receives a large amount of blood flow and it consumes a lot of glucose in the brain. And uh, it's also highly interconnected and regions within this network have very dense connections. They, they serve as kind of connector hubs or transit hubs and really functionally we think that they may be very important for integrating information and also polling information and generally working as a kind of uh, key center in the brain a kind of um, orchestrator or, or conductor for brain function so to help you along uh, an analogy might be a capital city in a country so it's it's there are um, regions in the brain that are 
especially important, they're particularly important, it seems, for consciousness and normal cognition, just as a capital city is incredibly important for the functioning of a country, for instance. What else do we know about the default mode network? Well, um, it undergoes significant ontogenetic development, so that means it develops uh, significantly um, over, um, through maturity from infancy to adulthood. Uh, it's also, the regions within the default mode network have also undergone significant evolutionary expansion, so they're much bigger in humans than they are in primates, for instance. Uh, it's, like I said, it's, it's, these regions are especially metabolically active, uh, more so than elsewhere in the brain. For instance, this posterior cingulate cortex hub, this region that's highlighted, will become increasingly sort of relevant to my talk because, um, well, I won't give away the results, but I kind of already have. But um, it, uh, it uh, consumes, or rather it accounts for, it receives 40% more blood flow than elsewhere in the brain. So it's an incredibly um, active region in the brain. But there's a lot of uncertainty about what its function actually is. And the sort of discoverer, if you want, of this default mode network has referred to it even as the brain's dark energy. So making the analogy to dark energy in, in cosmology, it's something that's there, but we can't easily study it and we don't really know what it does. It's engaged during self-reflection complex mental imagery, uh, mental time travel, so that's thinking far into the future or contemplating back into the past. Also theory of mind or trying to understand and interpret and make inferences about somebody else's um, thoughts and, and state. And metacognition in general, which means thinking about thinking. So all these functions are associated with this default mode network. Raquel, the discoverer of this network is also referred to as being the orchestrator of the self. Others have uh, suggested that it may even be uh, the sort of seat of our personality, of our sense of self or agency or identity or ego, if you like that term. Default mode network in depression, well, um, connectivity within the default mode network has been found to be increased or elevated in people. Uh, with, with patients with depression and the uh, stronger the connectivity between two particular hubs in the default mode network, this posterior cingulate cortex hub and this medial prefrontal hub, the stronger the connectivity between these regions, the higher the rumination scores in patients with depression. So the more they chew things over, the more they're inside their own heads, thinking about how terrible generally they are um, and uh, you know, dwelling on lots of negative things. So to get on with our results and what we found, that's what I've just said provides a kind of background to help you understand uh, our results and what they mean. So this is what we found. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, so uh, the results were quite surprising. They weren't, they weren't that surprising, but uh, they were quite surprising. We were actually expecting to find um, increases in brain activity based on people's descriptions of the psychedelic experience as being incredibly profound, somehow kind of consciousness is uh, expanded, it's more than it is during normal waking consciousness. So we thought that we might see, on a very simple level, uh, more uh, brain activity, more brain blood flow. And we actually saw the opposite. So when I discussed these with, uh, with David Nutt, um, he said, well, you know, uh, this kind of gives us confidence when you, when you have a hypothesis and, and you test it in science and you find completely the opposite, you, you can actually, uh, you know, start thinking that you found something very important, you know, because there are kind of implicit biases to, to support your own hypotheses. But when the, they're kind of sort of shattered, then, then you've got something really interesting to get to understand and to know what's going on. So this is what we found. We found decreased blood flow in the brain and we found it in particular regions of the brain. And those were regions of the default mode network, such as the posterior cingulate cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, other hubs in the brain like the thalamus subcortically, and other high level cortical regions. What was quite striking was these uh, lower level um, visual uh, or um, sort of specific cortical 
regions um, like the visual cortex or the motor cortex, they didn't really show marked decreases in blood flow. So the highest decreases seem to be constrained to these hub structures in the brain. And this may provide some clues about what the drug's doing in the brain to change consciousness. That just shows you the very dense connectivity in these regions that were showing decreased blood flow after psilocybin. We also found that there was a correlation between the magnitude of the decreases in these regions and the uh, self-rated intensity, the subjective intensity of the drug effects. So those who had very profound, intense experiences with the drug had the biggest decreases in blood flow in these regions. And we actually replicated this result uh, doing a, another study using another um, fMRI modality, the BOLD signal of fMRI, and we, we found decreases in that study as well. Uh, so that, that kind of gave us further confidence. That's in 30 subjects now. So we thought, you know, we were onto something here, and, and we really did find something important about how these drugs work in the brain. So to provide a kind of outside context for these results, it's interesting to look at other studies and other brain imaging studies and, and how the brain changes under other altered states of consciousness. So looking at meditation, um, it's been found that uh, consistent regions uh, to those that we found in our study um, show decreased activity during meditation, and particularly so in experienced meditators. That's just to show the comparison between the meditation results and our psilocybin results, and particularly in, in this medial prefrontal region of the brain here. So decreases with meditation and also with psilocybin. What's interesting is that this region is quite reliably overactive or hyperactive in depression. And it's also been found that a number of effective treatments for depression all normalise this overactivity in the medial prefrontal cortex. So that includes um, SSRIs, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, sleep deprivation, which can be very effective for depression, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, which is very effective, although it's controversial treatment, and placebo. And those who respond to placebo, you'll actually find the same normalizing of this overactivity um, that you, you find in depression. Also deep brain stimulation. So an invasive procedure actually targeting uh, key nuclei in the brain that are overactive, these, these medial prefrontal regions, and uh, essentially shutting them off with electrical stimulation. That's also been found to reduce metabolism and blood flow in the medial prefrontal cortex. Also ketamine, which is emerging as an effective short-term treatment for depression, that also decreases medial prefrontal activity. So this hopefully provides a context and Really, um, these brain imaging work, uh, this brain imaging work together with some recent clinical studies involving psilocybin kind of gave us the confidence to um, apply for a grant to the MRC to do a, uh, a study, a clinical trial in patients with depression, giving them psilocybin, intravenous psilocybin, to try and decrease their depressive symptomatology. So we were successful in that. And, Really, we were kind of spurred on by a lot of the um, reports of our volunteers, also the, the, the clinical work that's been done before, looking at, for instance, anxiety in, in um, patients with end-stage cancer that have existential anxiety around death. Uh, psilocybin's been given to these patients, and it's been found that it will reduce anxiety um, ratings and also uh, ratings of depression. And, and these effects seem to persist, so this is actually six months on from a single dose of psilocybin, you'll find that depress depression scores will still be um, significantly reduced. So this volunteer was from our own research and she said after her experience with psilocybin that ever since Thursday, I, I'd say I found it much easier to engage in the moment, to attend to the here and now. There were some fountains and the water was being blown by the wind. This is after she left the scanner, she wasn't hallucinating fountains. <laughs> Uh, allowing the sun to highlight the spray. I could have watched it for ages. Somehow the beauty was enhanced. Whatever it was, it's lasted, like the sun shining through the leaves this morning. It made me slow down my walk to work and enjoy the experience of it flickering over my face. So this was quite consistent. We had a lot of people describing this kind of afterglow after their experience. Actually, the acute experience itself is often not 
um, enjoyable for people. People describe it as being uh, quite anxiety provoking. It's strange. They feel a kind of uncertainty in this strange state of consciousness. And actually, often people are pleased when it's over. However, you know, that being said, um, people do uh, describe having a kind of afterglow after the experience that they feel good, that somehow um, the burdens of life feel less weighty. Um, this is the kind of thing that people were telling us after their experience. So what about how the drug works in the brain? That's the key um, topic of the talk. Well, one of the um, most useful measures that we've looked at with our work is functional connectivity. So I'll give you a very brief um, explanation of what functional connectivity is. So essentially the um, activity in the brain when we use fMRI and bold fMRI to, um, to uh, record brain activity. We find that it fluctuates in this um, sort of spontaneous manner. It naturally goes up and down. And if you uh, look at sometimes distally uh, separate, uh, sometimes quite remote regions in the brain, and you look at their fluctuating activity, sometimes you'll find that it's actually synchronous. So here we've got a yellow trace and that's from uh, I think it's from the PCC the posterior cingulate cortex and an orange one and you can see that they're, they're kind of synchronous they they sort of go up and down in phase and this provides us some information about uh, the kind of common function of these regions that they're, they're working together as if they're um, one whole system an integrated system so we see that here and these this is, these are actually regions of the default mode network you can see the the activity is going up and down in synchrony. There's also other networks in the brain where activity sometimes shows a competitive or anti-phase relationship. This network here is concerned with kind of visual um, attention and, and focusing on, on specific things, engaging one's intent, intent, um, attention. Right, so what did psilocybin do to functional connectivity in the brain? Well, uh, we looked at uh, the hippocampus first. So we looked at regions in the brain where activity was synchronous with the hippocampus and those regions are shown in orange. And then we looked at how connectivity with the hippocampus changed after psilocybin. And this result was really quite striking because despite looking everywhere in the brain, we found that it was specifically these default mode network regions which fell out of sync with the hippocampus. So usually these are kind of part of the same system these are subcortical nodes belonging to the default mode network. And yet under psilocybin, there was a disintegration of their activity. It, it became decoupled from, from the hippocampus. So that was quite interesting. Uh, it's, it's known that uh, there's a, a correlation between um, the coupling strength between the hippocampus and the uh, default mode network regions, um, the higher the coupling between these regions, the more often we uh, sort of exit the, the here and now, the present, and the more we sort of daydream about uh, the future or, or about the past. So the more that we do that, the more we kind of introspect and, and fall out of the moment, the stronger the coupling between these default mode network regions. So it's interesting in the context of psilocybin, these are drugs that people describe as um, altering time perception, um, people uh, struggle to, to really fathom uh, the passing of time um, and it, they, they sometimes say that time almost becomes meaningless. So it may be that there's something going on here between coupling between the hippocampus and the default mode network regions and this uh, change in, in time perception that you see with psilocybin. So some more network results. We looked at uh, a medial prefrontal region, and it's another node of the default mode network. And these are, um, in orange, this is connectivity during baseline. We also looked at that dorsal attention network, the one in blue in the previous image. And these are regions that are functionally coupled to this region, the seed region, during um, pre-drug conditions, um, during baseline. And this is what the drug did. So it, again, it decoupled activity within the network. So it's essentially working to disintegrate these functional brain networks. And we think that might account for some of this uh, fragmentation of con cognition that people are describing um, after they've had their experience.
So my, more recently, uh, we've used a, a brain imaging modality called magnetoencephalography, or MEG, or MEG. And this is a particularly useful brain imaging modality because it more directly records or measures brain activity. It gets closer to the actual um, uh, neural activity itself. With fMRI, you're always um, having to make assumptions about brain activity through this signal, which is dependent on blood flow in the brain. So you always have this kind of confound, you're sort of looking, looking at this surrogate marker of, of, of neural activity, whereas with MEG, you get much closer to the actual um, oscillations in neural aggregates in the brain. And then we can look at how psilocybin affects these oscillations. So this study again was in 15 healthy volunteers. It was a simple design with um, a five minute pre-infusion of psilocybin baseline, and then a five minute post-infusion um, uh, period where we would look at the changes caused by psilocybin. Again, it was a placebo controlled design, and we did a basic subtraction looking at activity post-drug versus pre. So the first thing we saw were the subjective ratings. I'm going to summarize these for you because there's a lot. Primary um, effects actually with uh, this dose of psilocybin and also with the mode of administration are um, generally perceptual. Um, however, more profound effects do occur, but they're more, they're more variable. They differ more from person to person. But there were two effects that are particularly interesting because they correlated with the brain changes that we saw. And those are this um, experience of, um, of the experience having a supernatural or, or magical quality somehow um, conjuring up sort of ideas that something metaphysical was going on. When people scored this item high, you'll see in a moment they had very marked changes in brain activity. And another item which is particularly interesting because it kind of speaks to this default mode network and what its function might be, is this item, um, I experienced a disintegration of myself or ego. So all these items um, bar um, the bottom five um, were significantly rated significantly higher after psilocybin. But these two items were particularly interesting because they seem to explain um, or correlate with the brain changes that we saw. So what were those changes? Well, kind of reassuringly, they were consistent with the fMRI results that we found. So we saw decreases in oscillatory power after psilocybin. And this was found in a range of different frequency bands from the very slow oscillations in the brain, this delta frequency, to um, much higher oscillations in the brain, this high gamma frequency. They were particularly marked in this uh, alpha frequency band and especially um, located to the posterior cingulate cortex and other, again, high level cortical regions. So what, is, what, what does decreased oscillatory power mean? Well, it, it actually means that the amplitude of the oscillations in that frequency band were more shallow. They, it, the amplitude decreased because the, uh, the neurons essentially weren't um, oscillating as synchronously. There was a desynchrony in the brain caused by the drug. So those items that I highlighted, um, there was a very striking finding when we looked at correlations between the different subjective ratings and particularly the decreases in alpha power in the posterior cingulate cortex that were especially marked. Um, so that kind of constrained where we were looking. We also corrected for the fact that we were looking at all these different subjective uh, ratings, all these different items. Uh, and we found that the significance of this correlation still remained uh, significant despite looking um, at so many different cor potential correlations. So there was a highly significant effect where the, the bigger the decrease in oscillatory power or the bigger the desynchrony in this region of the brain in this frequency band, uh, the higher people rated this item of experiencing a disintegration of their ego or of their self. So that provides a, quite an interesting clue that there's something important about alpha oscillations and potentially uh, such a high level um, phenomenon as our sense of self. There are some interesting, um, there is some interesting research and some reviews around uh, the alpha um, frequency. And for instance, it, it increases through ontogeny. So it's 
it's something um, like connectivity in the default mode network that seems to increase as people develop or mature into adulthood, which again would map onto this idea uh, that there's something important about uh, this, these default mode network regions in relation to, to the sense of self or the ego. We also found that there was a, the other item which came up as being significant when we controlled for, for the sheer number of tests that we were doing was this one that refers to um, the perception of the experience having a supernatural quality or a magical quality. And this is interesting because um, particularly if you look at um, um, Freudian theory or psychoanalytic theory, Freud said that uh, in the absence of the ego, uh, consciousness is more uh, magical. It, it takes on a kind of regressive, primitive quality. And so it's interesting that these two items came up, one concerned with the ego, the sense of self, um, and this other one concerned with um, uh, sort of reality uh, testing and, and, and magical thinking. So in the absence of, of sort of um, uh, diligent reality testing, then people will be more inclined to, to have magical thinking. It also speaks to people's descriptions of the experience having a kind of spiritual, sometimes religious quality, um, which is interesting. So uh, the brain is organized in a hierarchical fashion, and this is kind of exemplified by uh, the visual system. And this is quite complicated, so I don't want to go into too much depth with it, but essentially it was an extension of the MEG analysis we did. And we looked at different cell types in the cortex using uh, a modeling approach to see if um, we could discern how changes in activity in the different cell types could account for the effects that I've just shown you. So when we ran this modeling approach, we found that the particular cell types that came up as being um, significantly modulated were these deep layer pyramidal cells. And they're the same as these layer five pyramidal cells where the serotonin 2A receptor is especially densely expressed. So again, we have this nice consistency where um, we know the, the serotonin receptor um, through which the drug uh, sort of initiates its effects, we know where those receptors are, and then when we're looking at the macroscopic level, albeit with modelling here, we find that there's a consistency between the effects that we see at that level and, and what we know um, based on where the receptors are in the brain. So putting this in a context, it's slightly um, uh, sort of... Um, bit of a, a difficult inference to make, but um, in a recent uh, write-up of this work, we've we talked about the um, evidence that these deep layer pyramidal cells are particularly concerned with top-down uh, um, processing or providing contextual information for lower level regions in the brain, given that the brain is organized in this hierarchical way. So if we're exciting these regions that provide context or provide sort of, sort of higher level information for, um, uh, for information that comes in through our sensations, then it may be that uh, the, the sort of contextual information might kind of contaminate consciousness. So for instance, um, if we have information coming in and there are regions, higher level regions in the brain concerned with, for instance, seeing faces, then if these uh, modules become overactive, then it may be that we start seeing faces where they don't actually exist. So we've described this as being a kind of um, inference before evidence or, or um, impetuous inference is another word, that, another term that we use. So the kind of um, the predictive, the inferential function of the brain is sort of, is sort of bleeding into consciousness and contaminating consciousness. And this may explain why people have um, kind of visual distortions and see things such as faces in, um, in visual um, scenes. So for instance, you know, seeing a face in a tree, for instance, might speak to this um, aberration that's being caused by, by the drug effects. Right, this is very, uh, if uh, the rest of it wasn't high level enough, this, this is kind of trying to get to grips with the uh, reports of people that they sometimes have spiritual or mystical experiences with psychedelic drugs. So in systematic analyses or assessments of, of the phenomenology of um, uh, spontaneously occurring mystical or spiritual experiences, 
this chap, uh, uh, Wilfred Stace, identified one key component which seems to be universal in people's descriptions of their spiritual or mystical experience. And that is this sense of oneness. So this sense of uh, everything being sort of related. Um, um, and he referred to it as this, this, this um, unitary consciousness or unitive consciousness. And it's consistent to some extent with William James's writings on the spiritual experience. And it's also uh, very consistent with people's descriptions of the psychedelic experience. They refer to this sense of oneness. So although this is very abstract, there are actually some clues now um, from uh, brain imaging about um, what might underlie such a, um, such a strange and profound experience. So just from our own work, uh, one of our volunteers said after their experience that that was real ego death stuff, a total dissolving of the ego boundaries I only existed as a concept or as an idea. And this volunteer said it was certainly quite difficult to know at times where I ended and where I melted into everything around me. So again, speaking to this um, notion of ego boundaries, which is, uh, talks to the, uh, the idea of, of having a distinct sense of self which is separate from the external world. Um, and this is sort of um, different to the spiritual experience where there's a kind of melding of the self with the external world. There are no boundaries, there is no self and there is no world, there's, there's oneness. So what might underlie that? This is another description from, from another team in the US. One of their volunteers said, there was a feeling of no boundaries. I didn't know where I ended and my surroundings began. Somehow I was able to comprehend what oneness is. So it's all speaking to the same thing. So I talked earlier about functional connectivity and also talked about how activity in different brain networks sometimes has the co this competitive um, property to it. As activity in one network network goes down, activity in, in a, another network goes up. Interestingly, the functions of these networks which show this competitive uh, relationship are also um, very different. So for instance, we have the default mode network, which is concerned with introspection, with a sense of self, with looking inwards. And with, then we have these attention networks, which are concerned more with scrutinizing the external world. And so in a way you could think of the default mode network as being self or subject or internal and these, these uh, um, other um, attention networks as being concerned with um, sort of uh, objects um, uh, outside or, or external. So they're kind of diametrically opposed both in their function and in the activity that underlies these networks. So then what do we find with psilocybin? Well the interesting thing is that we find that this competitive relationship actually breaks down under the drug. So instead of having this um, sort of natural competition between the networks, we find that they're sort of behaving as if they're the same network, that, that there, isn't, there aren't two competing networks anymore, there's just one. And we think that this potentially may be related to the sense of oneness that people describe under the drug. What would support that idea would be that if we could find that in states where there's a related uh, phenomenology or psychology uh, to the psychedelic state, if we found the same brain activity in those states, then that would support this idea that there's something going on where, where this breakdown of competition relates to this experience of, of a sense of oneness. So some states that, that um, share this, a similar phenomenology to the psychedelic experience, well it's been found in schizophrenia that these, this between network um, sort of competition does decrease. Uh, the um, coupling between these networks increases because their competition is decreasing. And particularly in early psychosis or in the at-risk mental state, so in people who are showing risk, risk factors for conversion to psychosis. And that's particularly interesting because if you look carefully at the phenomenology of schizophrenia in general, then you'll find that it's particularly in the early phase of the disorder that there's a strong um, similarity between the phenomeno phenomenology of the psychedelic state and that of, of what you see in this um, uh, disorder. Also, interestingly, in, in deep meditation, it's been found that this um, uh, comp competitive relationship between activity in these two networks decreases. 
and particularly in a form of meditation referred to as non-dual awareness, which actually promotes the dissolution of um, subject-object uh, differentiation or, or um, ego boundaries, essentially. So that's been found as well. So there's this interesting consistency here where we're finding that in states that share a phenomenology to the psychedelic state, we're also seeing the same neurobiological phenomena. Um, so this has led us to hypothesize that this may be underlying the disturbed ego boundaries that you see in all these states. So very briefly, a, a, the most recent analysis we've looked at um, is this uh, analysis referred to as metastability. And really this is looking at the stability of different brain networks over time. And we found that the um, particularly high level networks in the brain, uh, it's not shown here, but the default mode network is one of them. When activity uh, in, uh, or rather stability of activity um, in these networks increases, rather sorry, decreases over time when the, the networks become um, less stable. Uh, this is what we see under psilocybin. So there's a significant increase in the um, sort of instability or rather decrease in the stability of the networks over time. Their behavior, behavior becomes less predictable. They become more chaotic. So just to summarize, we've seen decreased brain blood flow in uh, the major transit hubs of the brain. We've seen decreased integrity in key brain networks with psilocybin. We've seen uh, you know, a marked decreases in the rhythmic structure of cortical activity after psilocybin. We've seen that um, hyperexcitation in these uh, deep layer pyramidal cells um, occurs under psilocybin. And we've seen that networks that usually have um, sort of uh, competitive or oppositional um, activity uh, become behave more like one under the under the drug. So all these things have, have led us to make um, a kind of general theory of how these drugs are working in the brain, and it relates to the idea of entropy or order. And essentially, uh, a lot of work at the moment is talking about sort of um, there's a, there being a, a, a sweet spot in brain activity where. Um, there's a perfect balance between uh, complete disorder and um, s sort of um, a complete order. Um, and it's at this sweet spot that cognition can be supple enough um, and flexible enough, um, but also ordered enough not to be chaotic. We think that um, there are certain states that, um, that sort of exist um, towards a more chaotic um, sort of configuration, and that would include REM sleep, also early psychosis, uh, the sensory deprived state, deep meditatory states, the near-death experience, and the psychedelic state. And you'll find that the phenomenology in these states is related, so the next stage to test this theory is to see where there's, whether there's a related uh, neurophysiology in the psychedelic state to these different uh, states. Other states which might exist on the other end of the pole would be things such as seizure, where the activity in the brain is hypersynchronous. Sedation, again, even though it's quite a different state, consciousness is lost, but neural activity becomes more synchronous. Deep sleep and depression as well. We think that this might be a sort of ov overly stable state where a particular brain network may dominate cognition. So this is a kind of metaphor, I've presented quite a lot of difficult stuff, but if you want to take one thing home, it might be that these drugs seem to work in the brain, at least we're making the inference, that these drugs seem to increase um, the sort of uh, chaotic nature of brain activity. Um, this notion of entropy is particularly interesting because um, as a measure, it actually um, is a measure of our uncertainty about a system. So as a system becomes more disordered, it's hard to predict its state at any one time. And we think that um, uh, this may relate actually to the phenomenology that people experience a kind of uncertainty in their quality of consciousness as the brain networks become more chaotic in their behavior. So I think that's my last slide. And just to thank my boss, David Nutt, and lots of funders and uh, you for your attention. Thanks.